So good evening everybody and um, a formal welcome. My name is Claire Adams, I'm Deputy Head at Ringwood School. I'm here um, for a bit of the e-safety input tonight and also just as a bit of technical on the Zoom. So I will compare tonight and I'd like to introduce you to uh, colleagues who are um, also here this evening. So um, Mrs Simmons, if you'd like to introduce yourself. yourself. Good evening, I'm Leanne Simmons, I'm head teacher. Delighted that so many of you have joined us this evening and I hope it's a really, really good and informative um, session for you. Nice to see you. And Mr. Massimino. Good evening, uh, Mr. Massimino, head of year seven. Uh, we have had a very, very busy week this week and last week preparing you all and getting all your children into year seven. I've had a brilliant time getting to know them, getting to see them in their lessons and I'll be talking to you a little bit more about what I've seen tonight. Thank you, Mario. And uh, Mrs. Warnell. Good evening, everybody. Great to see so many people here this evening. Um, my name is Louise Warnell and I'm Assistant Head for Teaching and Learning. Thank you, Louise. And finally, uh, Mrs. Heaver Webb. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rachel Heaver Webb and I have um, responsibility for assessment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That's great. And uh, we're going to kick off with Mario, and I'm just going to share our slides that we've got um, for you for this evening uh, so that we can um, share those with you. I shall just admit a few more people who are coming in and put the slides from the beginning. And um, Mario, you probably will be able to proceed those on, but let me know and I'll do it for you if you'd like. Okay, Mario, over to you. Okay, so as I said, it has been a certainly a busy two weeks. I know we were all ready for a decent long sleep on Friday night, but it was a great pleasure to welcome your children onto the school site last Monday in their new uniform, well, nearly all of them in their new uniform, um, ready to go at Ringwood School in their new houses with their new tutors and raring to go. And I've been in many tutor times, many lessons. I've been around at many lunch times. And for the most part, we've seen lots and lots of smiles, lots of students getting stuck in. And I've really, really been proud of their resilience and their enthusiasm. I want to thank you as parents for letting me know how well things have been going in, with your children, what they've enjoyed. Some I know have been bouncing out of bed in the morning, raring to go. And equally, in these unprecedented times, letting me know when things haven't gone so well for your children. Transition is hard any time and this is not any time and the children have done really well but we know it will take a little bit longer so if your child is someone who hasn't taken it all in their stride they are not alone there are definitely a few we are supporting and looking after every week so if you have any questions have any queries do let your tutor, students tutors know let me know but it has been lovely to see them as part of team ringwood over the last week and a half I'm going to be in the comments know, section sorry, today. can I just say, and um, while you're mentioning about comments, because I forgot to say at the beginning, if parents would like to ask any questions during the session this evening about the content of the PowerPoint, then if they'd like to use the chat facility, then they can post questions there. We'll try and um, cover those as we go through. But um, I know you're talking about day-to-day -day questions there, aren't you, which go through the normal channel. So excuse me for uh, speaking over you, but just to let parents know on the chat, and I'll just put a post on there. It's always a pleasure to hear from you, Miss Adams. So yes, if there's anything tonight you want to ask questions about, absolutely fine. If there's anything not specifically about this evening, please do let your tutor, uh, children tutors know or give me a shout. But as I've said, uh, they are growing in confidence. They are growing in enthusiasm every day and it's been a pleasure working with them. And I look forward to working with them and you even more over the next few weeks and months. Okay, so I'm gonna begin, um, in fact, Mrs. Warnell, I think you're going to begin with curriculum maps, if that's okay. Apologies, just realised I was on mute. Mr Massimino, would you mind clicking the PowerPoint, please? Thank you. So um, just a little bit of information about the curriculum that your children will be studying and students, if you're listening, that you will be studying. Um, each of our subjects have provided for the students an overview of the learning for the whole school year in the name of a curriculum map, which is what you can see here. And um, there's no need to be completely overwhelmed by it because there's a lot of information on there, as you can see. But what is broken down, thank you, is the skills, knowledge and understanding that the students will be learning for the whole year. 
And uh, within that, we have got two other sections as well. So the upper section is the skills and the knowledge. And then the lower section, if you could click on Mr. Massimino, thanks. Um, we have some extra information as well, which I'll explain in a moment. But what we've also done to help, because we had a bit of feedback from parents that there was quite a lot of information on the curriculum map, um, was that we had broken them down into a unit at a time with more detailed information. This allows students to be able to track and tick off their learning as they go along. They'll be looking at them in class as they go along just to kind of review their learning and look at what's coming up and they can self test um, themselves as well with all of the information that's on there. Um, if you could move on Mr. Massimino, thank you. Um, within the map, there's two interesting um, sections that could be of use. One is the how can I revise section, which is there to support any um, student that wants a little bit of extra help. There'll be some techniques. There will usually be websites and links and um, possibly some revision strategies as well. So that's the kind of support aspect. And then on the next slide, we have just um, the other section, which is super curricular activities. They are um, broadening, they are there to broaden students' knowledge and to help them be curious in their subjects and show an interest into the wider areas within the subject. So there'll be some interesting suggestions of things that students could do, um, visits or extra reading or um, clips that they could watch. And this is very much for the students, for themselves, to develop their own um, interest in a subject and their independence and study skills. So that is what is on the curriculum maps. Um, the students have them stuck in their books and the unit sheets they will have um, as they go along in each subject over the half term. Uh, they are on the school website under curriculum. Um, they went on there yesterday, the new updated versions. So you will find them on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ornell. And then when we have a look at where the information is on the school website, I'll just briefly show that when we come and have a look at Teams, if that's okay, with uh, parents. Thank you, Mrs. Ornell. Uh, over to Mrs. Heaver Webb. Um, good evening. If we just um, start off by just flagging to you the fact that one of the things that we do at um, Ringwood School is to reward your child's scholarly attributes. So this isn't an award that's to do with ability. This is an award that's absolutely to do with the attributes and characteristics as a learner that we really want your son or your daughter to develop in all their subjects at Ringwood School. So things like curiosity, asking questions, having the confidence to talk about the subject, finding out more, all those sorts of attributes. And when we do progress checks, and that's twice a year for year seven, every teacher will consider whether or not each of the students in their classes demonstrates those um, characteristics and if they feel that they do they will be rewarding them with a scholar award so when you get your uh, progress check you'll also see whether or not your son or your daughter has been given a scholar award for any particular subject and obviously sometimes we have students who demonstrate those attributes across the board which is amazing or in lots of different subjects and so if they demonstrate them in a certain number then they get letters home and they get badges um, so so just to, to flag that to you, if your son or your daughter comes home after the first progress check and tells you that they've been awarded the Scholar Award, that's what it is rewarding, those attributes and characteristics that we are hoping your children will foster with us. Thank you, Mr. Massimino. Would you click on? Okay, so I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about how we set your children targets. Now, it seems rather odd to start um, in year seven thinking about GCSEs, but the reason why um, this slide is on there is to show you that actually we use GCSE targets to work back and to map out a target for each subject that your son or your daughter studies in year seven to make sure that by the time they go through key stage three and get to year 10, that they will be on track to at least achieve the GCSE target grade, which sits behind all the information. So you'll know, especially if you've got older children, that now all GCSEs are graded from a nine at the top to a one. 
And when they come in in key stage three at the beginning, um, we use the data that we have. Normally, of course, uh, we have the key stage two national uh, SATs. This year, we have something slightly different in that we have data from your child's primary schools. And we also are going to use um, CAT data. CAT stands for Cognitive Attainment Test. And at some point over the next few weeks, each of our students will do some, um, some tests online and that will give us lots of information about lots of different elements of their abilities. All of that data gets put into a sort of national uh, system and that data will show us what sort of target grade your son or your daughter might end up aiming for at GCSE if they take that subject on by the time they get to year 10 and year 11. Now, of course, at this stage, because they are very much far away from those GCSEs, we make our um, targets quite wide in year seven, eight and nine, because obviously they've just started. Sometimes they're picking up subjects, of course, that they haven't studied in primary school. But what that GCSE target does, thank you very much, Mr. Massimino, is it shows us um, what we call a flight path, that if your child is working at least in that flight path, or of course, a uh, flight path above, that that means that they will be on track to begin year 10 in a really good position in order to go on and achieve at least their target grade. So if I just use one example, if um, we, the information we have suggests that by the time your son or your daughter gets to year 10 in French, their target grade is a six or will be a seven, then for key stage three, they will be given the target flight path of secure. And so what we use that to check in every progress check is that if they're working at a secure level in French or, of course, at a level above that in mastery, then we know that they're on track to be where we and you would hope that they would be as a minimum. Of course, it's always a kind of floor, not a ceiling, so they can go above that. Um, but where we would hope they would be all the way through key stage three and into key stage four. So when you get the first progress check this year, you will get another piece of information with that that will show you, and of course we'll share it with your children as well, um, that will show you what target flight path your child has been given in each of their subjects. And they may be slightly different in each of their subjects because of course children have different strengths and weaknesses. So you'll get a piece of information with all those targets on and you'll also get the flight, the, the progress check information, sorry, from each teacher, which will tell you whether or not over the course of the few months leading up to the progress check, your child has been working within that flight path or above that flight path or if they're perhaps one flight path below their target, you'll be given that information. If they're more than one flight path below, you will be given the information that they're well below target. So all of those pieces of information will come out to you for every single progress check that we send home. And of course, as you can see on the slide, we also really importantly send home information about your child's attitude to learning in each of their subjects in two different areas. Their attitude to learning in the classroom, and their attitude to learning with regard to home learning, which I know we're going to mention a little bit more later on. Thank you very much, Mr. Massimino. If you would like to see what um, descriptors actually underpin each flight path for each subject, each subject, sorry, they are all also on our website underneath assessment. And so you can go and have a look and that will show you what it means to be on the developing flight path in English or at the mastery flight path in maths. It will just show you what the skills are, what the knowledge is, depending on the subject, that actually your child is demonstrating to be at that flight path. And of course, really importantly, it will also show you what the skills and knowledge are for the flight path just above that, if your child is perhaps hoping to exceed that flight path and go up to the next one in the next progress check. And those flight paths, broadly speaking, will remain the same for your child throughout key stage three. So if they have a flight path of developing in science in year seven, then they will continue to have a developing flight path in year eight and in year nine. But the descriptors, the standards that sit behind those flight paths obviously get harder in year eight and in year nine. Thank you very much, Mr. Masmino.
Thank you, Ms. Heber Webb. Um, moving on to um, some information about Microsoft Teams now, and I've seen on the um, chat actually a few questions about Microsoft Teams. And uh, other questions, be assured that um, Mrs. Simmons is busy reading them all and we'll have a, a short FAQ section at the end where uh, just other questions have arisen. But hopefully we're going to cover lots of the things that are coming up for you um, through, through the different topics that we're covering. So um, please keep posting them, but uh, hopefully we will cover many. So Microsoft Teams, some of you might be using it in business. We touched on it um, very briefly at uh, the year six evening that you came to. But we're working hard to ensure that um, we got teams up and running for our year sevens. We've been waiting for them to get their new logons to ensure that um, they can access the teams portal through school. Uh, Mr. Massimino has put on the, uh, the chat that actually they're having two tutor time sessions um, to get familiar with teams. And they're also using it in their IT and computing lessons. So they're getting lots of, um, of opportunity to use it in school. However, the other reason we might need to use Teams is if they are at home, and that could be because they're isolating, um, or it could be because um, we've had to move to another national lockdown. So um, I just want to show you a little bit about um, Teams and how it could look at home. There are lots of really helpful videos, and as you can see on the slide here, uh, they are on our website. And if you are looking uh, to download the app, which I would really advise, and um, you as a parent, if your child will um, input their logon details, could you also have it on your phone if you wanted to, to see what's being set for them. So you can have it on multiple devices um, is, is really useful. So I'm just going to stop sharing and I'm going to now put up um, my um, Teams page uh, via the school website. So I'll just um, open up the school website and so you can see that. So um, hopefully this will share for you. So this is our um, main school page, which you, you know uh, you can get to through the ringwood.hans.sth.uk. Um, information at the moment is being held on the academic page, and Rachel has alluded to the curriculum page, which has got the um, flight path on it that, um, sorry, the um, curriculum map that Louise was talking about as well, and the descriptors. So you can see there, year seven curriculum maps for 2020-21, all there for you to have a look at. And um, we can see some of the um, characteristics of um, the flight paths in there as well. And I'll just get uh, Rachel to remind me where those are in a second. Also in that academic page is something called stu student remote learning. We set this page up when we went initially into lockdown and uh, lots of really good information has been added to here. Not least the um, help videos that you can find and um, please do watch those because um, they are really useful to, to use. The bottom ones and I put on there are um, five, six and seven. So how to install uh, onto an Android uh, device if you have a tablet or phone, uh, how to uh, put onto an Apple if you have an Apple uh, product and finally how to install onto a PC. So you've got different ways of downloading the app and that video will talk you through that. The students just need to remember to sign in using their uh, login details, but they will be very familiar with that from the practicing they're doing at school um, in order to do it. And the videos talk you through that as well. Just a note, the best browser to use is Google Chrome. Uh, many of you will have heard if you're interested on the news that Internet Explorer is being um, phased out. So hopefully you've got Google Chrome loaded onto your machines and so you can use that. Also on the school website, you're going to see this up at the top here. Now, this is important, for, again, for uh, working remotely or uh, wanting to get emails from home. The students uh, might want to communicate with a member of staff about something. Uh, so the HAP stands for Home Access Portal. That allows the students to log in and actually see their My Documents as if they were on the network at school. So perhaps they've started some work that they want to finish for homework. Uh, they can access that through there just by using their same logon, which is their surname and first initial. Um, so they can use that as their username. Their email, which is um, Office 365, so that will open up for them uh, again, just logging in as their, their school username. And then finally, the Learning Zone, which is um, the main portal, our SharePoint portal, for all of the information that we have for students. And um, they can go through here and they can find Teams or they can download the app and find Teams, two different ways, depending on what devices you're using. But if I go to um, my top what we call waffles 
I can pick up Teams here. You can also see that I've got all of the software. So don't worry about your fact you haven't got Microsoft loaded at home. That doesn't matter because actually with the 365 um, login that the students have from Ringwood School, they can access all of the uh, Microsoft products. So just again, an app and you can download it and there are videos to help with how to, how to do that. So I'll open up Teams for those of you that haven't seen it before. Um, it's a fairly uh, user-friendly site. Uh, teachers got to grips with it within about two weeks uh, over Easter holidays to get up and running with it. It supports video lessons, it's got calendars, and it um, also will have um, opportunity for um, students to be able to see um, comments from their teachers, etc. as well. So I'm just going to sorry share my uh, desktop one because I just prepared that ready for you to see. So um, you can see that the classes are all named. So I teach a, an IT class of year sevens myself, which is lovely. And um, this is my, so it stands for Information Technology and Computer Science. And I teach 7R. So uh, there's the team. So the students who are in my class or similar will see that and they'll see that for all of the timetabled subjects. We've this year renamed them a bit better so that um, students and parents can be a bit more aware of what the class team is about. So in we go to there. And we can see on the front page as it loads up that there are posts there and you can see that um, there have been some assignments set and one of my students has already completed. Harry, if you're here, well done. Uh, and um, there will be files that will be saved in there, but more importantly, we have assignments. And this is where students are given access to information um, about um, home learning, or maybe in this instance, classwork to be done in class, just so that we can keep it all in one place. And the teachers are able to set different assignments for the students to be able to utilize in, in their class. So I'm just gonna go back and I'm just gonna take that off the post. Um, so that we can uh, load it there. So I'm just going to go to that one. So here's the assignment loading and all of the students will be able to see that. Um, she says, hopefully. Let's go and, I'll just go and do it for my year eight class. I'm not sure why that one is not going, probably because I want it to load and that's always the time it doesn't, isn't it? So here we go, I just have a look in my year eight and uh, just hope that that's not a technical glitch that's occurring there, which maybe. It is. So I'll come back to that because I'll just have a look. I'm just going to let it um, ponder because it might just be because I've got lots of things open on my um, my screen. Here it is. I can see the blue where it's going. Um, so the calendar is there as well and um, scheduled lessons if students are off um, can be placed in there so that they can join the team call more easily at the time of their lesson. Uh, chats can go in there as well so that students can communicate with the teacher or they can also communicate with um, other members of the class, so for shared work, that's always good. And the activity bell at the top, um, if you do load it onto your phone or tablet, you can set the notification so you will be able to see when um, work is set and when it's due in as well. So that's quite a useful one to, to have there um, so that you can see, see what and when is, is the demand of it. We're working towards having home learning set through Teams by at least Christmas, hopefully before half term, if it all goes to plan for, for us and our teachers. So we will start to have it on there. And then we have the opportunity to be able to provide a report home on a Sunday so that you can, as parents, see uh, what is being asked of your children and also whether or not it's been submitted or not. So here's an assignment that I've set um, for my year eight class. So it was just a bit slow to load. And here's the student view. So this is what the student sees. So um, I've set some lesson work in there and some homework in there with some information and the students then can hand it in and I can give feedback on there as a teacher and I can mark it on there as a teacher. So it's a great one-stop shop for stuff to be uh, placed in there and for students to be able to access it. So should we go into another lockdown situation, Teams will be the major portal. But as teachers, we are trying to use it now because we see the benefits of it hugely from a home homework perspective. So um, hopefully that's been, been useful to, to see that. And um, please feel free to watch this, this back and look at the videos so that you can have a look at um, what it is that we put on there. So back to the PowerPoint. So our remote learning, as I've said, there's the Teams dashboard as it will look like. Go and have an investigate. If you can do that tonight or over the weekend and then come back with any questions to your tutors, they will be able to help you. Your IT teachers, computer science teachers all be able to help you on Teams. Um, and you watch those videos first and foremost because they have been done 
and used by all of the students who were with us um, before we broke up for the summer holidays and they found them really useful. So we did more and more based on that. Um, communication, if you um, could, we're going to send you a link tomorrow with regards to how to access the Sims Parent app. Now this is an app for you, you parents to have information such as timetable, it gives you a chance to look after your own data in terms of personal details and medical details for your um, child. It's important that these are kept up to date and we no longer send paper copies of, um, of your details to update with. So you can go straight on there if your mobile phone number changes or if you've moved house or your email address changes, you can do all of the editing of that for yourself in there. And it's really important that the emergency contact details from a safeguarding point of view are kept up to date because um, if ever we need to contact you or another trusted adult, um, having a number of contacts is, um, is preferable. Three is where we really ask to be. So we have three emergency contacts on the system. You'll also see the calendar in there. So you can have a look at that. That will give you push notifications. So that will alert you when different things happen. Um, attendance can be seen through there that's just got a delay of two weeks in it so that we can just communicate with you um, to, to make sure we know if it's ill or medical or what, what it is and the progress checks will go in there so as an incentive to download it we actually let you have the progress checks through Sims Parent app first before we push them out on the email just to try and incentivize the use of, um, of the parent app because it's a really good place particularly from a data protection um, position for us to have everything up to date. So you'll get an invitation tomorrow uh, via your email. Please do just check your junk. It will come from a Capita website um, uh, email address. So it might just go into your, your junk information. You will just need to register um, with one of the following accounts. So, so um, if you've got any problems with that, then we've got um, parent app support at ringwood.hants.sch.uk. Or likewise, if you don't receive the email and it's not in your inbox, then please do email that address um, so that you can get that information um, as, as you need it. And hopefully you'll be able to download that nice and easy. It's a, it's a computer as well as um, uh, mobile phones, smartphones or tablets. You can have it on any of those devices. So hopefully that will be a really useful app that will continue to grow over the five years, seven years your, your children are with us at Ringwood School because um, Sims are continuing to develop that and uh, we, we're hopeful of good things happening through there. So um, I'm just going to take a breath there and see if um, my colleagues want to answer any particular questions or um, I've not been looking at the chat. So anything around Teams, did anybody notice that could be cleared up? Mrs. Sim. I'm really happy to answer the COVID question that was um, raised. And that was how were the new kind of, how's the new regime going and what would happen if there was a positive case? So first of all, um, we're all getting used to this kind of new post-COVID sort of, well, not post-COVID, but post-advent of COVID world, um, which has meant that there's a one-way system inside the building, which has meant that we've got staggered start times, end times, and um, lunch times, that we've got zoning around the school, that we've got additional cleaning going on. And we have all been, and we're sanitising left, right and centre every three seconds, and we have all been getting used to that. We have been making changes as we've gone along. Um, so when your children would have first arrived, they would have been particularly exhausted last Monday because at that point we had a one-way system around the outside of the school, which was a bit like the M25 and you had to go a very long way around. Um, since then we've looked at that and we've just thought it's outside. As long as we have the keep left, keep moving, um, then that will work quite well. So one-way system inside the building, but actually we are very lucky in Ringwood from when it's a rainy day because most of the travel between different buildings and different places is outside there are not not many inside corridors and certainly not of any great length um, at Ringwood so most of it is is outside so students have been coping very 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 well with that um, the arrival times thank you very much for everything you've done to try and ensure that your child does arrive between 8 30 and 8 40. that's taken a little bit of getting used to from the whole school community um, and still, the Parsonage Barn Lane entrance is by far the busiest. That's traditionally where students would always come in in normal times. Um, if your child would prefer a slightly quieter um, gate, we would recommend the gate near the infant school or across Carvers. If your child walks across Carvers, across the, the, the fields, um, towards the school's tennis courts, there is a gate just there that's open every morning. And those two are much quieter, actually. So um, your child might prefer to, to enter that way between 8.30 and 8.40. Um, break time, the zoning is going very well. The year seven area that we've got um, for your children is a brand new area to us um, and we're really, really pleased with it. It's working really well. So your children have the ability to go on the Astro 
all go on um, a green space and they are obviously just all kept separate to other people around the school and at lunchtime as well it's only their year group going through the canteen only their year group eating in the dining hall if they want to eat inside so all of that sort of zoning is is going very well um, we're, we're keeping a weather eye on things obviously um, so the issue of masks was sort of hotly contested um, by schools across the land right at the beginning of should should we shouldn't we as you know we've said that if you wish to wear a mask in, in communal areas that's no problem but again I think probably because we don't have much corridor space because you're nearly always outside um, actually not many children are choosing to, to do that and take that up as an option so that's absolutely fine and again we will continue to constantly monitor advice and change things when, when and if we have to. The second part of the question was about what if there is a positive case and we have seen schools all around us haven't we have positive cases so I think we have to be realistic in thinking that it of course could happen. Um, the government advice is nothing happens on a suspected case, nothing happens when somebody just has symptoms and goes for a test, everything waits until there is a positive test result. Upon a positive test result, I would then contact, um, up until midnight, it would be the public, um, our local public health England team. From tomorrow, it will be a dedicated schools team. The government have made that decision this afternoon. They're going to change um, the way that head teachers can talk to um, local, <coughs> local public health just to ensure that um, we've got dedicated school support. So I would phone them. We would then do what's called a rapid risk assessment and work out who has been a close contact. My feeling, I mean, obviously I've not been through this, but my feeling is it is likely that it could be the entire bubble. It could be the entire year group that would then have to self-isolate for 14 days. But none of that is published because it is all very, very dependent upon what has actually happened involving the actual child who has then tested positive. So we just have to wait and see um, if that were to happen, exactly what the outcomes of that risk assessment would be. If then a year group or a class had to go and self-isolate, children would have to go home for two, um, for two weeks, for 14 days, and isolate. The rest of their household doesn't have to isolate unless they themselves get symptoms. And they definitely do not need a test unless they themselves get symptoms. And um, well, we've, we've all seen the headlines um, in the last day or two about testing. The government is very clear about it. it's only when you have symptoms that you test so children would be isolating at home and then immediately their learning would switch to remote learning and that might be some stream lessons that, that might be some live lessons that might be some assignments that on teams as um miss adams has just shown us no i've seen different things coming up in the chat but i can't read them and talk at the same time are there any other questions i, I wonder I move on to e-safety and then um i'll let you have a look with simmons and then we'll come back at the end for the final faqs perfect okay all right so um i just wanted to take this opportunity as we do every year really to share a little bit about e-safety uh, as your children move into secondary school you get a little bit less contact again with the teaching staff and you probably get a little bit less feedback from your children about how their day have been has been um a case in point on the image on the front here so whether you're um technologically savvy or whether you are totally aside from technology um i just want to give you some information that's going to help you speak to your children about what it is that they're doing online and um, help them stay safe in um, an ever-evolving world really that that is um is the internet obviously the internet brings many 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 strengths um but it also can bring with it some some pitfalls so i just want to um to share you with you this video um because actually children are still the same children are still children curious and inquisitive as we were uh, when we were at school so let me just show you this
So I'm sure you'll have seen lots of um, information from Think You Know through your primary schools, but that's one of their latest um, clips that they're using to just show to parents really that um, children are still the same, but just the way in which they operate and communicate has changed massively. And um, we really have to get on, on board with it to um, ensure that, you know, we are talking to them in a way that they are comfortable with about things that they know about that perhaps we don't immerse ourselves in particularly. So, um, you know, social re media really has change the way in which we communicate with each other and children particularly um but curiosity about friendships and relationships remain the same it's the same thing it's just in a different medium and a different form so you have to remember um that when you're talking about these things that perhaps you don't feel as comfortable and confident about but it's still the same things that your children are exploring so understanding apps sites and games they sort of come under four headings really um, and parents will often say that they feel overwhelmed by the amount of different apps that are coming and emerging constantly. And you'll have seen the information I sent out last week about TikTok and the videos that were being shared. And we will talk from time to time, try and alert you to things that we hear about. Um, but it's important that you have open dialogue at home. Um, but, you know, there are um, really only four actions that most of these apps will uh, permit your children to do that, that that's what they're designed for so maybe these four areas will help you to focus your conversation with your children so that you don't feel so out of your depth when you start talking to them so let's have a look at, at um, these in turn so viewing um viewing things on uh, or information on the apps is one way that they can um Give children opportunities to learn and gain information and get support so um, thinking about that um, it's really easy for children to come across inappropriate information that actually they can view things that um, if your filters aren't um, as stringent as they might be perhaps you might have um, you might not have uh, the filters on the mobile phone but perhaps you've got a filter set up on your wi-fi at home so there's a bit of a mismatch there so you just have to think about that. Um, also the privacy of, of for young people as well and what information they are sharing, their security settings, which then will hopefully just mean that they can't view um, as much as, as they, they can in terms of the whole world wide web. Um, there are lots of things out there that are tagged, and this is what I was saying about the TikTok um, video from last week, as fairly innocuous um, things that are everyday mundane searches perhaps, but have been tagged in order to um, pro promote different um, areas of more adult information that we wouldn't want. And that's why a lot of the apps actually are 12 and 13 age restrictions. So if your children are using TikTok or WhatsApp or um, Snapchat, then actually they are age restricted because of the nature of the content that can be on there. Um, and so you are opening them up to a world that is more adult perhaps than, than you would want them to view. So for example, um, you might ask yourself, what, what content can they see? Um, is that age appropriate? Uh, what filtering privacy settings do you have and, and how do you know? And what would your child do if they do, did see something that was upsetting or that they were uncomfortable about? comfortable about what what would they do so what strategies have you got at home maybe an agreement around that would be useful so um, sharing is a big part of the education that we do in school and talking to them about what they share online um, it's so easy to take a picture of yourself or somebody else and share it to the world um, you might feel like you're only sharing it to another person but that person can promote and post it anywhere and share it through different um, channels to their heart's content. And once it's gone, you can't get it back. And I'll always say to the, to the young people that if you wouldn't want your grandma to see the picture, don't send it, uh, let alone really don't take it. So, but part of taking the pictures and sharing them is, is about their creativity and helping them to really you know, express themselves. So there is a reason why they're doing it. And for many um, young people, they reckon it's um, 60 plus selfies before they find the one that they will post so can you imagine um that how would you ever find time to to do your job or or even do your homework so um perhaps having a conversation with them um, about their body image and and um where we get information about what we should look like from mostly the media with very heavily um tweaked imagery 
that makes young people feel that they have to live up to something that actually is not real. It's been digitally enhanced. Um, I mean, it's really share th- easy to share things online that you wouldn't normally share face to face. And I think that's another thing to talk to your children about is, you know, would you share that? Um, if you were standing in front of that person, would you give them that information? And if not, then you ought not do it online either. Um, and it's important what the motivation is behind it. Is it because um, you're trying to impress somebody? Uh, is somebody pressuring you for something to be shared? Um, you know, so making sure that they know if somebody is asking for something that they don't feel comfortable with, what are they going to do? <clears throat> Who are they going to speak to about that? Hopefully that's going to be you. If not, it's going to be their tutor. And if not, it's going to be a trusted adult in the school or, or in your family wider group. It can be awfully embarrassing for young people. So just making sure that you are um, comfortable with how that would be. We also encourage young people to look out for others. Um, so under the sort of, sort of data protection, actually, if you don't have consent to share from somebody else, then you should not be sharing images of other people, um, adding other people into a WhatsApp group so that then lots of people can see their mobile number. Actually, if they haven't given their consent, that's like taking somebody to a party and then leaving them there when they don't know anybody and going. Um, and we wouldn't do that in the real world. So inviting people to a WhatsApp group and then perhaps um, letting other people use their number that's not appropriate either. So thinking about consent to share is a really important one. So what you might be asking your children are, what are they sharing and who are they sharing it with? Um, And what are their their ideas behind it of the reason why they're sharing? So the chatting and the friending is an interesting one as well, because obviously that is a good part of um, the internet, is that um, you can get outside of the Ringwood area and beyond and international And um, on the internet, this can be fun and appealing for young people. And there are lots of online apps um, and different community groups that you can join that might be more suited to their interests. And perhaps they found something that um, they haven't been able to find locally that um, will just, you know, make them feel more connected. However, this also opens up the opportunities for adults, other adults to contact them, perhaps um, pretending to be Uh, a child of a similar age in a school locally or or somewhere a bit more distant but actually they aren't and I know in the primary school the children will have been told a lot about um, the people who on the internet aren't always who they say they are so thinking about um, how many friends do they have following them and actually if it's over 50 it's very unlikely they have that many friends and so who are these people and actually what might they be doing that is not as wholesome as, um, as our young people think. Our, our young people are super trusting and that's a lovely quality to have, but we also need to have a little bit of questioning as to what the motives of people and actually if they aren't people we know, we shouldn't be having them join. So maybe a chat about who is it that they are friends with and um, a bit of information about why they shouldn't have people that they don't know and a bit of tidying up, a bit of housekeeping on that. Some children may find it difficult to tell you if something is worrying them online. And um, it can be quite embarrassing, as I say. Or they might think that you won't understand because it's not a life that you've known. You, you may say to them, oh, I don't know anything about this um, IT or the computers. I can't make my phone work. Make my phone work for me, some of you might say. Um, so, you know, it's... It's really important that we try to um, meet them on their level. Obviously, you can't be an expert. We don't all live in that that world. But um, it's vital that they know that they can talk to you or, like I say, another trusted adult if it's that's important. So, um, you know, a question to ask might be, who who are your friends and um, how do you know them? And again, what what sort of things are you chatting about? And it might be that they show you some of their their chat history and... um, you know, it would be interesting for you to see the way in which uh, the communication online is um, quite different to that um, of a face-to-face nature. So there are four areas that hopefully will stimulate a little bit about what um, kinds of content they are seeing, what they're sharing, who they're talking to and where they are, and who can you be friends with and uh, making sure that um, you've got that covered. So hopefully that'll give you a little bit of a structure to um, feel like you can open up conversations with young people. So another hat that I have is that I'm the uh, designated safeguarding lead at Ringwood School. And one of the things that I deal a lot with is the um, sharing of images um, that young people take called, um, they are um, sexting, it's it's known as um, nudes, you might hear it referred to as well. 
Um, so just thinking about how we can stop this from being quite as prevalent as actually it is. Um, so this slide really just details a range of contexts and motivations in which young people may share a naked or semi-naked photograph of themselves. And just because their face isn't in it or just because they've got their underwear on it doesn't make it right. They shouldn't be sharing images of that nature for them. Um, it's important, not least because it's illegal, that uh, that would be considered to be the distribution of child pornography. And if you're in the receipt of it, then the receipt of it as well. Uh, and then if you share it, then again, you're, you're in um, possession and distribution of child pornography. So it is serious and we do work with our local police on it because it can be life changing if these things, um, images get into the wrong hands and are shared maliciously. Um, and, and once they've been sent, like I say, they can never go away. Um, so young people often refer to nude pictures as either nudes or simply pics. So you might see that written or, or heard. Um, and it's for a variety of reasons people might share, uh, young people are sharing them. Um, this can be a positive experience if done um, consciously for some they can feel, but of course it also exposes them to huge risk. Uh, and it might be that they think, oh, well, you know, I really like this person and um, it's, it's my first love and all of those things that we've all experienced before, but without the social media element. And um, they can be led to do it. And of course, as we know, often, um, first loves will, will go and um, we will have other loves and there's nothing to stop people then using those images later against people. And so we have to make sure that we're protecting our image to stop any of those things happening um, in order to protect ourselves. Okay, so it's really important again that you talk to your children about sharing images. Um, not about judging them or anything like that. It's about making sure that you talk to them about relationships, talk to them about sex and that you talk to them about the fact that actually sending nude images isn't, isn't in necessarily that sort of healthy context of what we might be wanting them to aspire to. They're less likely to open up and come to you for help if they need it, if you, they think you're judging them for it. Uh, but that's not easy because you could be very shocked by, by the thought of what's happened. Um, so consider starting off with an example from a TV program or an article that you've read about celebrity, because we've seen that where actually they've been used against people. So that you're removing the conversation directly from your child to actually a wider setting. And then explaining that if you know they ever had done that, um, you know they could talk to somebody if it's not you, a, a friend or a, or a trusted adult, in order to have a think about that, and you know discuss what healthy relationships look like, um, and the importance of of trust in a relationship, and of course consent. And uh, once those images have gone, it goes back to that: do you have the consent to share? And um, the answer always is really no to that. So, um, and, and also to remind them, and nobody should be persuaded into sharing nude images um, if they don't want to, and, and they shouldn't be. Um, if someone says no to sending one, then that's fine. You have to respect the decision that that's how it is. Um, and it's important that our young people feel empowered that um, they aren't to be coerced into doing anything um, online because it is permanent and you can't get it back. Um, so, you know, the sharing or, or redistribution without consent is a really important thing for them to remember. So um, many of your children will be gamers. And again, you might not know too much about gaming, but thinking about um, the games that your children are playing, Fortnite, Call of Duty, FIFA, um, these are all play anywhere games. So um, they can be playing with people from anywhere in the world. They could be um, grown ups, most likely. And so again, if they're doing that live stream with the headphones on, they may well be hearing content. Um, discussions chat that is of a really adult nature um, you potentially don't know that because their headphones are on so please make sure that um, you are considering really carefully the Peggy rating of those games and um, that you are talking to them about who they're chatting to online and what the nature is of that is and we'll come to thinking a little bit about um, settings in a moment of, of how long children should be online and um, Sleep is a really important one and we absolutely advocate children not having their mobile devices in their bedroom. If they tell you it's because they need an alarm clock, please do go out and buy them one um, that is just a, uh, a digital one or one of those big ones with the bells on the top that um, are the old, very old fashioned now. But please don't let them say that. Um, it is not surprising and you probably noticed it of your own phone how notifications can come in overnight and if they're on vibrate that can be very distracting. And for a student to not look at their phone when the, the alert comes in is absolutely impossible. 
And so um, once they've done that in the night, because of the, the background light of um, phones and tablets is um, similar frequency to daylight, then it can wake them up and it will be very difficult for them to get back to sleep. Also, if they see something that is text to them overnight or message to them that is a bit unsettling, they may spend the night worrying about it. And it's really important that for our young people to be successful, like Miss Heaver Webb said around um, our flight paths, that they are well rested because well rested means that they are up for learning in the morning and all good. Um, over lockdown, we've heard a lot about mental health of young people. And actually we are looking more and more as a generation who are becoming addicted to their devices. So having a healthy change from it in your family makeup might be something that you consider doing. Um, there are tools online where you can have a family agreement about what it is that you're going to do. Maybe you'll have a games hour or you know, you'll play, play cards or board games or do some reading even uh, just to make sure that they aren't just constantly on their device. It's very easy because they'll go off and they'll be quiet and you'll forget and then time ticks on and suddenly it's an hour or so and they've still been on the device. Um, do make sure that you know what they're looking at who they're communicating with and uh, making sure that they're continuing to uh, communicate with you. And uh, it's important that's part of, of your family life for positive mental health for those young people as well. Um, we tell the children um, around the here that um, obviously local employers, particularly JP Morgan the likes of them, will use your digital footprint uh, prior to um, recruitment. So they might type your name into a search engine and have a look at you know, the, the site that you had made um, when you were younger and uh, comments that you made, things that you liked and posted, uh, and they will make decisions about whether or not you're suitable for their um, business or not. So it's really important that uh, whatever you post, whatever you like, whatever you share, you will still be proud of um, in the future because people will be making judgments potentially on what they've seen of you. Um, so your digital imprint, your digital footprint is really important because um, everything you do, everywhere you look, everywhere you go, then it's leaving behind just sort of breadcrumbs of, of what, you're, what you're interested in and the sort of person you are and the sort of things you're looking for. We'll do more on digital footprints with our young people during their IT lesson. Uh, so we will really explore that because it's an important one, particularly as they go into later life, into their sixth form and then hopefully on to working locally. So just final, final few things from me, really. Um, don't be an ostrich. If, you, um, if you're not sure and you, you want some help, then find it. There's um, lots of great information on the Think You Know website. There's great information on our school website as well. But um, talk to your child about their life online. Uh, find out what it is they're doing. Take the opportunity to talk to them about how they're staying, stay, staying safe. They'll have had lots of information from primary school, but they don't all implement it. Uh, it's easy to forget, easy to think it won't happen to them really easy for you to think my child's not doing that but um, sadly I've dealt with some parents to where they thought that but actually their child is doing that so um, please don't think that it, it won't happen to you um, I hope it, it doesn't but uh, be, be prepared and talk lots um, explain any worries that you may have so what why are you asking these questions what is it that you're worried about um, because that will help them see that everything you're doing is to look after them um, if you've got any um, worries, then it's important that um, they can come to you, that they know they can come to you, and it will be that non-judgmental um, discussion that you will have. It's very, it's very hard to, to remove things from the internet, but actually, once the problem is shared, then adults can help take off the pressure and, and help things um, get better. If not you, then identify a trusted adult, somebody else, maybe an older sibling, uh, an auntie, an uncle, and let them know that you, you know, you're not going to blame them. We all make mistakes, um, but online they are just more visible and more permanent. And direct your children to age-appropriate information. That's really important that they see that. Uh, we suggest setting some ground rules, as I mentioned, so a power down hour perhaps before bed so that all devices for all the family members are put somewhere in, a, in an area that is not upstairs and um, you have that time watching the TV, uh, doing some, like I say, reading, which uh, we really advocate reading, um, or other things that just take them away from the isolation that come, can come from a device. Um, maybe having your devices all charged centrally in a communal area, so no technology is upstairs perhaps, or perhaps you have them in your room and they're all off and powering up overnight. Um, having that technology free time, so you are doing things together. 
and trying not to be secretive. I think you'll know the change in behavior of your child when actually they start to not let you see their phone. They're not gonna let you see over the shoulder of them if they are messaging. Um, start to be aware of the change in their habits. Um, the bottom one is really important and we'll say this when you get to um, GCSE years, it's very hard to change routines once they're older. So actually if you don't establish routines in year seven, once you get to year 10 saying to them, oh, now you can't have your phone upstairs and you've got to turn it off an hour before bed, it's going to be even harder to implement. So um, set up the routines now and have those as positive routines in your home. And uh, hopefully that will um, just help things go forward. So as I say, it's all on the Think You Know um, website. There's loads of really great information there. So please do go and have a look at that at your leisure. Um, Think You Know is, is great and it has it, it, lots of good resources that you can use and talk about. So please do have a look at that. Um, some other organizations, uh, Childline is great as well, so that you've got that um, information and um, a couple of other ones there. But um, reporting through Think You Know uh, and CEOP uh, is important so that um, if you see people who are using accounts that perhaps are malicious, then you can report that um, on, on through there. And finally, like I say, our safeguarding website, we put all of the information up there and I sent a link to um, a really good website for parents to sign up to on my last communication around about the TikTok information. So please do have a look there as well um, because we will update that as regularly as we can and um, hopefully you'll find information and answers there that will help. But mostly if you've got any questions then please don't hesitate to contact the school. Every, every um, device in terms of um, mobile phones, tablets and um, Wi-Fi routers are all different so if you've got questions about filters then please do contact your provider and they will be able to help you with that. So a whistle stop tour of safeguarding. I'm grateful for your time to have a captive audience just to um, talk to you about that because it is so important and actually getting e-safety right now can save you huge amounts of heartache later on as the children get older and start to explore even more. Um, we will continue to teach them about e-safety throughout their life at Ringwood School, particularly um, in year seven as they're doing their IT unit work on, on, um, on e-safety. So thank you again. And um, I'll just hand over to Mrs. Simmons to come back with any final questions. I think we've answered them all because we've been uh, typing furiously as, as you've been speaking and taking parents um, through that presentation, Claire. So hopefully um, that is everything answered. But Mr. Massimino wants to say something. Always got something to say, but I'd like to finish up with Jerry's final thought, if that's all right. A couple of things. Um, we've been in the Year 7 team over the summer, and that's all been reset and new. And it was great to chat to them. It was great to engage with them. We shared with them about how they should conduct themselves on teams. I've discussed how much I love a dancing penguin emoji, but uh, one from everyone in the year group is probably a bit much. But it, it, they've been brilliant. And I, I wanted to leave you with something else as well. Um, the, the students are very, very keen to do well, and we know that. And some of them are so worried about getting themselves into trouble that they are, that it is causing worry. We do have high standards, but if they try their best, they get involved and they're kind, they're not going to get in trouble. So they will make mistakes. If they forget a homework, talk to me, talk to their tutor, and we will put an arm around them and look after them. If they're struggling to get in on time, talk to me, talk to their tutor, we will look after them. Um, we have those high standards so your child can be successful in every single lesson and they are not there to worry them. So I hope you've enjoyed tonight. Lots more information to take on. It will be recorded and I hope you have a brilliant evening. That was such a nice note to end on. And can I now go back and answer a question that I forgot that I was going to answer? <laughs> really sorry. Um, there was a question earlier on about a worry about um, how are children going to be aiming for those GCSE grades given that they've had a period out, out of school at the end of um, their year six experience. What I would say to you is do not worry at all. They have a long period of um, their time at Ringwood for us to, to make up anything that we need to make up. Actually, the key stage two curriculum is quite different, particularly in English. The skills that, um, that is, are needed for SATs are not the same skills that um, we look at and teach at home. You'd think they would be, but, but they're not um, through key stage three and key stage four. So please don't feel worried or burdened um, at all that your child is coming in on the back foot. They absolutely aren't. You know your child has got a whiteboard. That's because teachers are very frequently assessing where they're at and, and learning about what they understood, what haven't they understood, where are they compared to where I would expect a normal year seven group to come from. And if they're not quite there, 
then that teacher will rapidly adjust what they're doing. We were talking today, even changing learning objectives sort of mid-lesson, just to ensure that we've got them where we need them and then we can take them forward. So please don't worry about that. And certainly when you're thinking about the right part in GCSE targets, we are a long way. And through that road, your child will, will make the progress because teachers will be designing and honing their learning experiences so they can. Um, Rachel, there was just a question about where a parent finds the flight path for their child. I don't know if you want to answer that one. Yeah, in terms of your child's individual flight paths, they will come home to you uh, with the first set of progress checks. In terms of the actual flight path descriptors, so the generic descriptors that say what secure is in maths, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, they are where Claire showed us earlier under the academic tab on the website and then just above the curriculum area where the curriculum maps are, there's an area called assessment and if you click on that area you'll see a sort of summary of the whole system, you'll see information about the attitude to learning descriptors and you'll see all the subject flight path descriptors as well. Thank you. That's lovely. Uh, thank you so much, um, parents and students. We've kept you an hour, um, so we will li like to let you get back onto your evening. I noticed I've gone into rather soft focus because I didn't turn my big light on, not used to having done this as we've come into the, the darker months. So I must remember mental note to self to put my, my main light on in my house to do the Zoom again. So um, thank you very much. And uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Please do stay in touch with us, keep communicating. And most of all, keep communicating with your young people. They're super and we're really enjoying working with them. Have a good rest of your evening.